Hi, this is David Swanson. I am recording this in Virginia on the evening of Wednesday, August 9th, uh, 72 years after the bombing of Nagasaki. Uh, but I state the time I'm recording this principally because I feel like I don't know what wars or crises or presidential tweets might occur between the recording and your hearing it. Uh, I want to thank the Ground Zero Center for Nonviolent Action both for having me speak with you, albeit by video, and uh, for all the wonderful work that you do and have been doing for years. Um, I am a, a big fan of Jim Douglas's book on the Kennedy assassination. I'm a big fan of everything Elizabeth Murray does. Um, I'm a uh, a fan of the, the great work that many peace activists do in Seattle, uh, and my friends at the Backbone Campaign uh, out in the Bay, uh, in Vashon Island, who are going to be part of, uh, of an event later this year in Washington, D.C., that I'll, I'll tell you about in, in a few minutes if you haven't heard about it. But um, thank you very much for having me. I hope I'm not, uh, I hope this works to do this by video, and I hope I don't seem too tired and it, this uh, setting doesn't seem too dark. I am recording this at night. Uh, it seems during uh, business hours uh, there's one urgent crisis uh, after another and I can't do, I can't get 30 minutes uh, without uh, crises uh, until after the kids are in bed. Um, but I, uh, I wish I were with you in person. Uh, I was out in Seattle, I think it was just last year, uh, and spoke at Town Hall and met lots of great people uh, and hope to get out there again as soon as I possibly can. Um, Elizabeth asked me to speak, among other things, to the question of how do we get more people engaged, involved, concerned. Um, I, I think it, we've reached a point where we can pretty well say it's not a matter of uh, persuasion, of intellectual argument, um, because if, if not wanting the entire earth rendered uninhabitable, the human species and most, if not every other species, eliminated doesn't do it for you, you know, I don't know what will. If, you know, in Washington State, being such a concentration of nuclear weapons, uh, such a prime target, you know, if if dying first uh, doesn't do it for you, I don't know what will. You know, here in, in Virginia, Maryland, West Virginia, you know, they've got underground fortresses uh, that somehow they fantasize getting different branches of the government uh transported to and hidden in uh, in time to survive a nuclear holocaust, uh, which, you know, I, I find absolutely ludicrous that they think they'll make it. Uh, but of course, they're not for any of the rest of us uh, who are, you know, less equal than they and condemned to die as they uh, hide out in their underground bunkers. Um, but you guys don't have those out there, as far as I know, so uh, you're out of luck. Um, there, was a, there was a Pew survey done uh, a couple of weeks ago now uh, in 38 countries uh, where they asked about various causes of concern, threats. You know, they asked about the threat of U.S. power and influence and Russian and Chinese. They asked about ISIS. They asked about climate change. They asked about cyber attacks, uh, you know, but just absolutely no mention of nuclear holocaust. And, you know, this is, this is what we're up against. Uh, the facts are very clear. We are ever closer, ever greater risk, ever more knowledge of how little it would take, how few nuclear weapons could create a nuclear winter and kill us by starvation. Uh, and yet, normalization, acceptance, obliviousness. Uh, you know, the, some friends of mine and yours, I imagine, Bonnie Erfer, Steve Baggerly, a bunch of, you know, great peace activists just recently went to Germany and cut the fence and went into a base, just as others had done a couple of years back in Tennessee. Uh, and they went and they climbed on top of the bunker and nobody 
would have known if they hadn't intentionally taken steps to make themselves known. Uh, so we're not even protecting the things. You know, the, the nuclear weapons, the nuclear power plants, the nuclear waste, uh, it, it, you know, this stuff is not even being guarded. It's accidentally being flown across the country and left on a runway. It's being shipped in trains and trucks, uh, and you can bring a pair of wire cutters and uh, get yourself right into the bases. Uh, so, you know, there's problem number one. Uh, problem number two is there being proliferated uh, to countries and the United States is leading the way in developing more of them, talking more and more about using them, uh, threatening to use them, uh, including depending on how you interpret it in Donald Trump's recent uh, fire and fury comment uh, directed at North Korea. Uh, so it's just an incredible gap between what we're up against and how people think about it. Uh, and I believe if we're going to change it, we're going to have to change it through organizing and communication beyond straightforward arguments, uh, because it ain't working. Uh, we need to get celebrities. We need to get young people to get other young people. We need to get organizations and organizers uh, actively engaged who can organize others. We need to make it fun and exciting and dramatic. We need to get arts and music and film involved in making people feel uh, what we're up against. Uh, you know, not in an insulting way. I'm not suggesting we shouldn't give people the facts. Uh, just that they have to be given the facts over and over and over again in different formats uh, if it's going to stick and create action. Um, you know, the, the other possibility in terms of argument uh, for what we're up against beyond we would all die, <laughs> some of us would die first, is that we would all die because of the actions of Donald Trump. Uh, you know, and I have been hopeful. Uh, I, I had hoped, you know, before Trump became president, that if a Republican became president, uh, we would see a dramatic increase in anti-war activism uh, above and beyond what we had seen uh, in, in the Obama years. Uh, and I've been principally disappointed. I mean, it hasn't been remotely what I thought it could be. Uh, I, I remain convinced that had a Republican initiated the, the policy of drone wars, of picking through a list of men, women, and children, and picking who to murder with missiles from robot planes on Tuesdays, that there would have been an uproar. But I think because it wasn't, and because Obama established that, and because Obama told us that you can't get rid of nukes in his lifetime, much as he'd love to do it, and that we need nukes to defend ourselves, although there's no logic or evidence whatsoever that nukes defend anyone whatsoever uh, in this country. It, it, you know, it's, it's, been, it's an uphill struggle. That, that impact of Obama's presidency is still being felt. The other argument you can make to people, of course, is that nukes could kill you uh, as a result of the actions of some evil foreign demon. But there's a double-edged sword, because hyping the evil of foreign demons uh, is what gets most people pushing for war. It's the, the principal piece of propaganda in the campaigns for most wars. We, the, the, the propaganda against Kim Jong-un in North Korea, for example, uh, it, it doesn't approach what we've seen on, on Vladimir Putin, but uh, at best, I'm hearing from people who've decided they finally are concerned about nuclear war, that the danger we face is a pair of lunatics that Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un, and he's a very even-handed, they're both lunatics. Uh, you know, I don't know enough about Kim Jong-un to call him a lunatic. I'm not a fan of his country. It's not a model society I want to live in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, he's behaved pretty rationally, pretty predictably. 
uh, as uh, have his predecessors in his government. Uh, and we've seen North Korea agree to and generally abide by agreements uh, back in the 1990s, uh, and the United States not. Uh, and we've seen North Korea and China make very clear they're open to negotiating, uh, but want the United States to stop the aggression, stop the, the practice first strike nuclear bomb flights near North Korea's border, stop bringing in the new missile technology and radar technology, uh, and negotiate uh, a, a, an end at long last to the Korean War. Uh, and the United States is not interested, will not take yes for an answer, uh, wants anything other than peace and resolution here. Um, and so, yes, it is very dangerous uh, for Trump to blurt out comments like we're going to give them fire and fury like the world's never seen, uh, even if he's given it no thought, even if he might forget it, if we chose not to keep reminding him he said it. Uh, but I think we have no choice uh, between trying to let him forget he said some stupid thing and activating people. Uh, I'm in favor of activating people and the, and the efforts to do immediate rallies uh, in Washington, D.C. and elsewhere uh, and to build up uh, energy against that particular war and all of the other wars is so badly needed. I can't discourage uh, any of it. Um, the, uh, the point I started to make that I think needs to be stressed, although I think many of you know it well, uh, the U.S. public does not. Nuclear weapons do not defend a wealthy, militarized country like the United States. They simply don't. They don't discourage uh, terrorist attacks by non-state violence, and they don't uh, dissuade any government. Uh, and, and the nuclear... The big nuclear nations have all lost wars with non-nuclear nations while possessing nuclear weapons. Uh, so they're not, they're not defensive. Uh, in fact, they're the opposite. They're offensive, uh, and they encourage their own proliferation, uh, and they will kill us by accident, if not by intention, sooner or later. Our luck will run out. Uh, the, the cases of near misses and near misunderstandings and, and, and accidental mishaps are just staggering. Uh, you should watch, if you haven't, the, the movie Command and Control on the incident in Arkansas where a nuclear missile was launched. They knew not where. Possibly the Soviet Union happened to go to a nearby field and not explode. But uh, based on the book, uh, Command and Control, uh, that includes many such incidents, um, nukes have been dropped on North Carolina and come very close to exploding. John Oliver says it's okay, that's why we have two Carolinas, but you know, at some point we have to stop laughing uh, and put an end to this absolute madness. Um, I was just, I, I just got back from Minneapolis. There was a great event out there called the Democracy Convention. Um, this is, I think, another answer to how do we get people active is we not not poach people from other movements, but merge multiple movements. Uh, so this was a convention with an environmental conference and a democracy, an election integrity conference, and uh, and the peace and democracy conference uh, that I was involved in. World Beyond War, the group I'm the director of, was involved in setting up, and and lots of other issues, uh, which yes meant there were ten things happening at any one time, but also meant that people crossed over from one interest to another, uh, and groups collaborated on panels and workshops, uh, and, and we built connections. Um, uh, anyway, I, I, while I was out there, I spoke three days ago on the anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima in a peace park in Minneapolis, and there were some young girls from Nagasaki who had come who sang a song. The Veterans for Peace rang bells, uh, and I ran my mouth, and it, it was a... Uh, it, it was, uh, very good gathering uh, of people, uh, active, concerned, and organized, uh, pressuring Congress, educating the public, doing everything they can in those Twin Cities in Minnesota. Um, one of the things I discussed in my remarks there 
was this incredible contrast I see uh, when it comes to which behavior is acceptable. And this goes back to the incredible gap between uh, reality and how people treat nuclear weapons. Uh, because a couple of weeks ago, the commander of the U.S. Pacific Fleet was asked, uh, would you nuke China if Trump told you to? And he was very serious and responsible and said, yes, we must obey orders. Yay, so so dependable. And, and you know, our, our friend in the peace movement, Jeremy Corbyn, uh, leader of the Labour Party in the United Kingdom and the next Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, if current trends at all continue, uh, was asked if he would ever use nuclear weapons, and he said no, and he was soundly condemned for being so irresponsible. And yet no one can describe an instance where a nation or the world or a person or anything would benefit from the use of nuclear weapons. Uh, you know, it's, it's all the, the madness doctrine of, uh, of deterrence uh, through pretense that you will use what you know there is no value in ever using. Uh, you know, and this is his best case scenario uh, with Trump uh, is that he's uh, on a Nixonian mission to pretend to be a lunatic. Um, sadly, I don't think that's what's going on here. Um, but I, I don't think it's hopeless either. I think uh, he's gone in a better direction on parts of what's happening in Syria and can be moved in a better direction. Uh, you know, the story is that Donald Trump saw a video of CIA-trained uh, fighters killing a child, and that that was critical to his decision not to arm them any longer, to, uh, to cease going after the Assad regime, and to uh, henceforth take part in only one side of that war, you know, which is, you know, a real come down for the United States. And, uh, you know, there is the possibility of somebody, yeah, I, I don't know if there's a way to get it on Fox News, but somebody getting to him with a video depicting what happens when nuclear weapons are used, or when Raytheon missiles are used, or when any of the weapons uh, being used in numerous U.S. wars now are used. There, there is that possibility. Um, there is also the possibility of building public pressure on Trump and Congress uh, and other nations uh, to sufficiently push back uh, to simply make it unacceptable, to make it a losing proposition for, for him uh, to consider using nuclear weapons. And of course there is legislation that Congressman Liu and Senator Markey have in both houses of Congress to take away from any U.S. president the power to launch a nuclear war without Congress. Uh, and, you know, I don't want to condone the supposed legality or right to, for anybody to launch a nuclear war ever with or without Congress. Uh, this is not legal under the United Nations Charter. It's not legal under the Kellogg-Briand Pact. It's not, uh, you know, we're out of compliance with the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty in the United States, uh, and it, there's no surviving. It's, it's suicide. But, uh, to take it away from presidents would be an important step that I'm in favor of pushing, uh, regardless of, you know, people's prejudices and, you know, which presidents they don't mind having nuclear weapons, which is absolutely uh, staggeringly uh, insane. But uh, let's take any opportunity. I thought we would have a lot more opportunities with Trump's face on U.S. power to build opposition. If this is a place where people see the sense of opposing presidential power, let's take advantage of it, uh, because this would radically decrease presidential power for all presidents to come for whatever time we have left, uh, which has hardly ever happened. Presidential power has been dramatically increasing for centuries and, and accelerated with the creation of nuclear weapons and their placement in the hands of an individual. That's been key to the creation of the imperial presidency as we know it. Um, so I, uh, so I, I, I also, in terms of obeying orders and this uh, 
commitment to obeying even illegal and even uh, planet destructive orders uh, in the US military. I contrasted that in my remarks with Vasily Arkhipov's action as a sailor on a, uh, on a Soviet submarine during the Cuban Missile Crisis who refused to use nuclear weapons, possibly saving the Earth. Uh, and I suggested in this park in Minneapolis that they put up a statue of Vasily Arkhipov, that that would be more useful to the world than yet another uh, evidence-free story of uh, Russian election hacking or Russian uh, crimes of whatever variety. Um, you know, it's not just that the United States has interfered in 82 foreign elections since World War II that I know of. Uh, it's not just that the United States routinely interferes in a much more damaging and violent and illegal way than that in other countries and has bombed 30 countries in the past 72 years. Uh, and it's not just that our election system in the United States is so incredibly corrupt and bought and paid for and unverifiable and, uh, and abused that one more abuse doesn't seem to me to, to transform it from, uh, you know, from, from uh, glowingly uh, uh, democratic to, to horribly compromised. Uh, it, it's, it's that this buildup of hatred of Russia is an even greater risk than Trump's talk of North Korea in terms of getting us into a nuclear war. The, the U.S. And, and Russian militaries don't talk to each other anymore. They did at the height of the previous Cold War. Uh, if we divide this into two Cold Wars, they talked to each other, and now they don't. Um, the, uh, the, the, I also suggested in Minneapolis that they have a native son there of St. Paul named Frank Kellogg, that they put up a statue of Frank Kellogg. And of course, nobody knows who he is, not even in St. Paul. We went all on Kellogg Boulevard and tried to find someone who knew why it was called Kellogg Boulevard. He's buried in the National Cathedral in Washington. Nobody in Washington's ever heard of him. And uh, if somebody explained who he was, they'd be forbidden to have heard of him, I'm sure. But this was a Secretary of State who was moved by an incredibly powerful peace movement in the 1920s to advance a treaty, the Kellogg-Briand Pact, that bans all war, that is still on the books. Uh, and I find it incredibly valuable to go back uh, to the 1920s and look at how they thought, how they organized, how they taught uh, peace, uh, and to hold up the Kellogg-Briand Pact and say war is illegal. Because the United Nations Charter, uh, you know, is understood by the public as having banned war or somehow made war a little bit uh, less barbaric uh, or arbitrary. It's understood by lawyers, U.S. lawyers, Western human rights lawyers, as having legalized war as having created loopholes that weren't there in the Kellogg-Briand Pact, at least not in writing and uh, not in popular understanding and not in the intentions of the activists who made it happen. And those, of course, are loopholes for defensive war or UN-authorized war. Uh, UN-authorized wars uh, these days are typically either uh, the bait and switch of uh, authorization to prevent a massacre that was never threatened in Libya that's used to overthrow the government and destroy the country, or they're just imaginary. You know, everybody imagines that the United Nations authorized the war on Afghanistan, whereas in fact uh, they're just trying to make it seem like the opposite of the bad war in Iraq, so it can be the good war. The United Nations, of course, did not authorize uh, the war in Afghanistan, but then people fall back on claiming that it falls under the other loophole. That is, the United States was acting defensively, and people have come up with bizarre theories to claim the United States is acting defensively uh, in all these countries. Uh, and in fact, we've seen claims of defending U.S. troops against Syrian aggression in Syria. And so we have to get rid of these loopholes. Uh, you know, we could stop stretching them. We could stop fantasizing they've been met. There's not a single war going on that meets the loopholes. But we ultimately have to get rid of them. Uh, and that means looking to the Kellogg-Briand Pact, looking to the, the absolute ban on war. Um,
we uh, we had an event at the National Press Club uh, yesterday morning that was on C-SPAN a number of times. Uh, I hope some of you may have seen it, pushing to get U.S. airplanes out of Syrian skies. <coughs> and we uh, uh, we s spokespeople did not all agree on these legal issues entirely. Uh, but I was asked by a Russian news uh, person about the uh, the legality of U.S. war making in Syria and in Yemen. And I pointed out that not only is the United States violating the UN Charter and the Kellogg-Briand Pact in bombing Yemen along with the with Saudi Arabia, it's also violating the Leahy Law, which uh, forbids the United States to participate in mass murder with other countries that violate human rights. Now, as I said there, I can't explain how you do mass murder while respecting human rights, but, you know, presumably uh, that happens all the time in most wars because Saudi Arabia is not your partner. Uh, but the other claim to legality that you hear there is that the exiled dictator of Yemen invited the Soviet, uh, Saudi Arabia and the United States to bomb his country. Now, this is the sort of thing that lawyers all take seriously. And it's the sort of thing that most open-minded internationalist, peace activists, anti-imperialists take seriously in the United States when it comes to something like Syria. They'll tell you it's legal for Russia to go into Syria and bomb people and blow up houses and fuel violence and uh, prolong the, the catastrophe, because Syria invited it to, and it's fighting enemies of an established government. Uh, but imagine if Donald Trump is impeached, as he needs to be, and removed from office, as he needs to be, and sets himself up on some private island and invites China or France or who knows who to bomb Washington, D.C. How many of you would take that as being legitimate? Because Donald Trump said it was okay, now it's okay. You know, this is this is the status of a dictator in some distant small country inviting some other country, coerced or not, to uh, participate in war. There, there's no legalization of war for that uh, situation in the UN Charter or in the Kellogg-Briand Pact or in any other law. War is war and war is illegal. Uh, and all uses of war are not equal to each other and uh, not the same in context or remedy, but... They're all illegal. Um, so the case that we make, I'll try to wrap up quickly, the case that we make at World Beyond War is that you can't have a good war. So we have to stop trying to figure out a legal war, a better war, a war with a bit fewer civilians killed, and do away with war. Because the fantasy that you could have a good war next year or 10 years from now is what generates the military spending roughly a trillion dollars a year by the United States alone and it's that spending that kills far more people than all the wars put together because tiny fractions of that spending could end starvation and diseases and the lack of clean drinking water and the use of fossil fuels uh, you know we could have a, a transformed world in the United States and abroad and have money left over we couldn't figure out what to do with if we moved money from the military. Uh, and we don't have to do it all by next week, but we could do it step by step. Uh, you know, and we have a Congressional Progressive Caucus in Washington whose own budget proposes to increase the military, albeit less than Donald Trump wants. We need to decrease the military spending. And this is something that I drafted as a resolution and World Beyond War worked on and U.S. Peace Council and Code Pink and other groups and numerous cities passed resolutions saying, do the opposite of what Trump wants. Don't move money from everything else to the military. Move money from the military to everything else. And this has now passed uh, through uh, the uh, U.S. Conference of Mayors and the U.S. Conference of Mayors has directed all of its member cities, uh, which is most cities in the United States, any city of a minimal size that has a mayor, 
not only to pass similar resolutions, but to hold public hearings. And this is of value in the long term, regardless of the immediate uh, budget legislation. Hold public hearings with the head of every agency and department in the local government and discuss what could be done with the money that your city sends to the federal government for the military and military purposes across departments of the federal government. Um, this came out of New Haven. New Haven has held these public hearings. Seattle should as well. Um, the, uh, so you, so you, can't, you can't have a just war because to have a just war, it would have to meet all sorts of impossible criteria coming out of mid medieval uh, books that uh, that I address in a in a book of mine called "War Is Never Just," and it would have to justify decades of deadly, murderous diversion of resources into preparing for wars, and it would have to outweigh dozens and dozens of blatantly unjust wars that have been created by that spending. And it would have to outweigh the serious and ever-growing risk of nuclear abolition that is created by the institution of war, and which we're not going to get rid of without getting rid of the institution of war, and outweigh the environmental damage, which is more than any other source of environmental damage, and the damage to militarized police and misrepresentative government, uh, corruption and secrecy and spying, it would have to outweigh all of that, which is just a burden you can't place on any war. So we have to start moving away from the idea that we'll ever use war, end the current wars, demilitarize, establish peaceful institutions of diplomacy and aid and conflict resolution, and recognize that Mikhail Gorbachev is right when he says, without getting rid of the aggression with non-nuclear weapons by the United States, other countries like North Korea will never want to get rid of their nuclear weapons that they see as defending them. So we, we can't just get rid of nukes. We have to try. We have to promote this new treaty with everything we've got, including promoting getting the United States signed on to it and getting the U.S partners that European nations that have U.S. weapons in them, uh, your allies in Scotland. We, we have to get everybody on board with this treaty, but we won't get the big nuclear powers on board with this treaty unless we get them off board with the ideology of war. Um, and so take steps nationally, but take steps locally. Make Seattle a nuclear free zone if it's not. Uh, uh, make it sign on to the to the treaty to ban the possession of nuclear weapons. Um, move divestment forward in every institution you can with a strengthened argument that nuclear weapons have become illegal. Uh, their mere possession is more illegal now than it ever was. Uh, join us in a new coalition, a campaign you'll find at noforeignbases.org, uh, which can address nuclear weapons bases as well as other militarized bases. We have events planned for early 2018. Um, and keep doing what you're doing with peace flotillas and boats and see if you might want to join us uh, for a flotilla to the Pentagon on September 16th. We're going to fill the Pentagon Lagoon just off the Potomac River right up to the edge of the Pentagon with boats and kayaks and giant banners no more wars for oil, no more oil for wars. This is the biggest consumer of petroleum. This is the biggest cause of these rising waters. Uh, we're going to bring environmentalists, uh, the Backbone Campaign and others uh, from Seattle and environmental groups from Washington, D.C. and around the country and the world and peace groups. And we're going to have a conference September 22nd to 24th, live streamed. You can organize viewing events, but come if you can, American University, Washington, D.C., no War 2017, War and the Environment. Uh, and we're going to bring together peace activists and environmental activists and figure out how we can work better together. Uh, because, in fact, the military is the top enemy we have of the environment. Uh, and the big environmental groups are not yet taking it on in the way that, uh, that we should. And 
uh, Elizabeth Murray and friends, uh, Sam Adams Associates for Integrity in Intelligence will be doing their annual awards ceremony at the No War 2017 conference. We're very much looking forward to that and seeing who gets the new award. Um, but check out worldbeyondwar.org for the flotilla, for the conference, for how you can get involved with us, the campaigns we're working on, campaigns you want us to help you work on. We're more than happy to. Uh, we're happy to email our list in Seattle to uh, attend good events like this or anything else. Um, and uh, keep doing what you're doing. Stay in touch. Here's some music. All of us out on the street thinks everybody should understand that killing don't stop killing very good. I don't care how it started, don't matter anymore, cause no amount of killing's gonna even up the score. No more war, no more war, tell Congress and the President no more war until they stop that killing we'll be here by the door till everybody's singing no more war we know why they do it making war that is they make a lot of money off of the war biz they say it's the price of freedom we know that's a lie they just like to make money don't care how many die no more war no more war tell congress and the president no more war until they stop that killing we'll be here by the door Till everybody's singing, no more war. And it's not just the people suffering the loss. Two hundred species every day going with the albatross. The air, food, soil, and water, we've got to share it all. And any war upon the earth is a war upon us all. No more war. No more war, tell Congress and the President. No more war, until they stop that killing. We'll be here by the door, till everybody's singing. No more war.